good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining today's panel on optimising rewards and minimising risk in DeFi. So in no particular order, let's give a round of applause. Firstly, to Michael Cortis from BCB Group. And next up, we have Rupert Bartsfield from Amulet. Come on down, I feel like a TV show host. And next up, Stanley Kuchoff of Aave. <laughs> and our fourth panelist is Yugevni Gokberg from RE7 Capital. Welcome. All righty, so let's kick straight off. This is a short 35 minute panel. There are questions at the end, so please do um, engage with the discussion today. So let's do some quick introductions, just a few lines from each of us. So first, let's start with Michael. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Michael here at BCB Group. Uh, I lead a product uh, for our markets division, focusing on uh, trading and yield. Um, for those who don't know, BCB are the world's largest uh, crypto service payments provider, um, looking after uh, some of the largest uh, clients in the industry, um, servicing like 30 uh, currencies worth in payments, but also look after trading, uh, crypto liquidity, custody, uh, yield, and also Blink, which is our instant settlements network. Thank you, Michael. Next panelist, Rupert. Good morning, everybody. I'm Rupert. I am from Amulet. It might be obvious by the t-shirt. Uh, we are a DeFi cover protocol. Uh, we're brand new in the space. We actually launch next week. We're on the uh, Solana ecosystem and covering risks around smart contract risk and stablecoin DPEG and um, others soon to come. Thank you, Rupert. Next panelist, Stanny. GM. Sam. <laughs> GM. <laughs> yeah. Good. Hey. Um, yeah, so my name is Stani. Um, I'm the um, uh, founder and CEO at Aave. So Aave is the team that uh, built the Aave protocol, um, which is a decentralized protocol uh, where you can supply cryptographic assets um, or earn yield on them and use them as a collateral um, to borrow uh, liquidity. It's a protocol that is governed by the, um, the Aave DAO, the community. Um, secures roughly uh, from 5 to 15 uh, billion worth of value within the smart contracts across um, multiple uh, networks. Um, and very recently, we've been uh, building the Lens protocol, which is a decentralized um, social media protocol uh, that gives you ownership for your um, identity, uh, social identity on chain and um, direct access to your um, audience. So effectively, we are a team that builds, builds access to uh, finance, access to uh, social, um, and are going to build more access. <laughs> Thank you, Stanley. And um, our fourth panelist, Yevgeny. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Evgeny. I'm the founder of uh, Reseven Capital, and our job is basically to be DeFi power users. We run regulated funds and we basically raise capital from the traditional world and from the crypto world. We raise it in a regulated manner and then we deploy it in DeFi as liquidity providers and run various yield strategies. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you to our panel for introducing themselves. So risk and reward, that age old trade off. It's the ultimate goal of any professional investor. I recall when I was trading interest rate market, seems like a lifetime ago. Um, I wanted to ensure firstly that my PL was healthy, but at all the same time stay within the risk parameters that the bank had set um, for my trading limits. Now, the risks in TradFi are well established and understood. For example, market, credit, liquidity, capital risk are well priced, and there's access to many products and services to hedge or mitigate against these risks. Now, DeFi is the same true. Are, the, are users exposed to the same types of risks or are there new types of risks? Cyber, resilience, consumer, and so on and so forth. And then on the reward side, is the distribution comparable to TradFi? And who should be participating in this new system, in these new systems? So to answer these questions, we have our illustrious panel here today, and they're each gonna spend a few minutes discussing from their own personal perspective in the decentralized finance eco ecosystem, how they see the risk and rewards. So let's get straight in and start with Michael. Um, and Michael is gonna to talk to us about his journey, onboarding Fiat, how BCB Group do it to optimize and integrate 
for volumes and transactions, etc. Over to you. Yeah, thank you. Um, so at BCP, as we're looking after a lot of institutional clients, essentially what's becoming uh, one of the main things to really focus on is actually cash management for, uh, for these clients. Um, and what we want to be able to do is ensure that they enter into the landscape safely, but also in a vehicle that is familiar to them as well. Um, the, the main problem that uh, clients are seeing right now, there's uh, a low interest rate environment despite recent hikes from some central banks, um, but also incredibly high inflation uh, pressures. And that's just eroding away the value of, uh, of a customer's uh, uh, balance sheet, essentially. Um, so, you know, traditionally uh, they would go to uh, T notes or whatever type of uh, savings products in order to uh, mitigate those losses. But uh, again, those products aren't earning, and it's actually the relatively insufficient returns. So, we feel that uh, crypto and DeFi uh, are the future, and that there are ways for uh, these uh, clients to be able to get access to it. And as, that's essentially what we built here at BCB. Um, essentially, we've created a special vehicle that allows to take customers' balances like uh, from their BCB accounts and be able to put them into, uh, into DeFi, essentially. And actually, one of the things that we've been able to do recently is work alongside uh, funds like Evgeny to be able to offer our clients uh, something different or alternative to what's currently in the market. Uh, and also, I should add that BCB Group is one of the paramount supporters for those that operate in the ecosystem that can't access, access the fiat payment rails. It's still a huge problem, not just in the UK, across the globe, that large banks aren't providing basic banking services to crypto organizations, whether CFI or DeFi. So it's really important, you know, as the ecosystem grows, that we have this transition where people can on and off ramp out of crypto into fiat. So does anyone want to sort of add to that or should we move on to, to the next statement from you, Gevney? Yeah, happy to, to follow on to what Michael was saying. So the way how we think about DeFi is that it's very simply put a new sector of a digital economy. We have the traditional economy with the financial flows that support that real economy. Then we had, you know, the Web 2.0 and the financial flows that support that. And now we have Web 3.0 and the relevant financial flows that support this ecosystem. However, as we've heard, there aren't many traditional banks that support this ecosystem, and you don't have all this infrastructure to lean upon. So what this means is you have all these digital consumption and these digital financial flows, and no one but the local community, so to speak, the local digital community, to provide liquidity. So then when you think about it that way, you simply need to analyze, okay, how do these financial flow work? What role can you take? Can you be a lender? Can you be a borrower? Can you be an insurance company? Can you be a lending marketplace? And then you need someone else um, who can provide capital into these marketplaces. And that's basically what we do. So our job is to look at this as very boring and very conservative money managers. Because whether it's crypto or not crypto, ultimately it's a risk management business where you need to understand the risks you take, you need to identify them, you know, measure them, and then deploy capital accordingly. And it is a very, very different space. So some risks are very similar. You, know, you can buy something which then goes down in value. You can uh, be exposed to fraud. You can you know, just made a, make a bad investment decision. You, know, you can experience a default. But uh, you know, some of the major risks in the space are uh, smart contract risks and you know hacking risks where you need to a have a lot of expertise in terms of how you manage that and b work with insurance companies that can help you offset some of that risk so just like in any financial strategy if you're not going to be specialized and very very focused the odds are you will be uh, you know taken for a ride by those who do this professionally which is no different to any financial strategy but ultimately it comes down to you know risk adjusted returns and whether you believe they are attractive enough but you know before i pass on the mic i guess one final thing i'll say is this year has been very interesting because it's the worst start to the financial markets in 50 years if not 60 by now because it's getting worse and worse every day so those who were trying to bet on growth uh, have taken a hit those who wanted to be cautious um, and therefore went into fixed income uh, were exposed to duration risk 
and took a very big hit. And uh, DeFi yield strategies, while not risk-free by any means, have proven themselves to be completely idiosyncratic and uncorrelated to this global, uh, you know, global conundrums of things that are happening. So therefore, there are people who have very strong bias against crypto and they don't want to touch it. But for those who are more pragmatic, uh, what we're seeing is that they're starting to allocate, you know, different pockets in their portfolios into something like this because it's just a very standalone uh, strategy product and universe, which for some people is quite interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Yugebni. And can I just sort of ask in terms of the risks that you see for your clients, are, are you providing services to retail or institutional clients? Yeah, that's a, that's a good, very good question. And none of this is financial advice. Uh, we only work with professional clients. So what we effectively do is we run something that looks like a hedge fund. So these are uh, people who need cash flow management. So we are working with crypto projects who are sitting on a lot of ETH and they want to deploy that ETH to generate some yield and extend their runway. We're working with hedge funds, fund of funds, high net worth individuals, again, crypto businesses who sit on stable coins and they would like to get some yield on that. So we are regulated. Uh, we raise capital in a very traditional manner. So, you know, it's not a button you can click, you have to sign some paperwork. Mm -hmm. And then you take that money and you deploy it as a hedge fund manager, but you deal with DeFi rather than, let's say, stocks. And uh, we have to be extremely transparent and uh, educational with our clients about the risk because the, very few people understand that risk because the only way for you to understand that risk is to be a builder, to be you know, an operator, an insurance provider, or to run a financial services company in this industry. And DeFi is realistically at scale, basically two years old, well, two and a half maybe. So if someone hasn't been through the journey from day one, they're very unlikely to be aware of these risks and therefore they need to be educated. Yeah, thanks for that. And just sort of to, you know, to be clear, there's a completely different risk profile to an institutional customer than a retail customer. Um, and that's what the regulators um, focus on, the consumer harms for the individual. So that sort of moves maybe nicely into bringing Stani in to talk about, um, you know, deploying strategies involved in, say, um, loan applications to creating rewards that you've done within your platform you know and how do you optimize these rewards and how are you thinking about managing the risk of some of your users um yeah i i, I yeah I, I think like the the risk uh, topic is interesting and in kind of like globally within the uh, web3 ecosystem especially in DeFi, because um i think it's kind of like a first time ever for a while where you have an um, a bit of like an open infrastructure to uh build uh, pretty much anything um, and for example like internet by itself had the same um, phase where you know you had this accessibility to information across um, a global network and and different opportunities and we started to build different tech so like going a bit even back in time um, I don't know if anyone remembers um, putting for example credit card details into uh, online store was something that people weren't were very no. hesitant to do <laughs> yeah I mean I was using my mom's credit card but still like the the, the kind of like a uh, um, concern was still there and you got you went to online forums and reading reviews and whether this particular uh, internet shop um, was actually um, legit so we kind of like have the similar moment in um, DeFi at the moment where um, we have this innovation because anyone can come and participate uh, and build innovation um, and, and just rebuild the financial infrastructure uh, in a way that it's more better in terms of transparency, um, the execution, um, and how it could be used in the future. Effectively creating like a global uh, liquidity market where anyone can have access and tap into. Um, and obviously when you have an open ecosystem, um, it also means that you, know, you have a lot of experimentations. Some of these protocols might be uh, not well designed, uh, some might be uh, built for a bit more scale. So the same way as in internet, um, you know, we're using on a daily basis the IP protocol or HTTPS, 
um, without actually caring what they are, but we know that they work for us, um, they're secure, and they work globally. And I think I like to have like kind of like a similar perspective to decentralized finance, where we, we, we actually see that some of these protocols and, and use cases and applications could be sca scaled to billions of people. And obviously, the, the infrastructure isn't, hasn't been there uh, for a long while. So, for example, being you couldn't do this on solely on Ethereum, but for example, now with layer twos, you can actually build that scalability and create a lot of opportunities. And I've been very much observing uh, quite a lot what is happening on, in decentralized finance on the user level. And I've noticed, for example, that the transactions on Ethereum, for example, deposits into the Aave protocol, they might be on average uh, 15 to 20,000 uh, in terms of their amounts. But when we go to protocols, um, well, let's say networks like uh, Polygon or uh, Optimism, where the transaction fees are just a fraction of what they are um, on Ethereum, you start to see actually deposits, average deposits of uh, 100, uh, sorry, 500 to 600 uh, dollars worth of um, cryptographic assets, but also you have uh, 20 times more users at the same time. So kind of like we, we are starting to see that um, scale. And then obviously you have, um, whereas, you know, you have opportunities and you have the risk as well. So effectively how you can build uh, protocols that are safe and secure and they're battle tested and how do you ensure that the infrastructure, uh, underlying infrastructure will actually um, work well. And I think we're still in a very early stage of decentralized finance where we're trying to figure out that, uh, and we're building at the same time and learning while we're building, but figuring out how we can actually build a secure um, an environment and risk mitigated um, infrastructure. What's been super surprising to me is that, and um, to many uh, within the community, is that many of these protocols are actually managed by the community. So um, uh, in one way, you could see a bunch of internet friends coming together and actually deciding on the risk parameters. But on the other hand, you actually see a lot of interesting um, argumentation on why certain risk parameters, interest rate curves, um, and how the protocols uh, should be in the future uh, come from these communities. And uh, because of the transparent open nature and the fact that anyone can actually come and contribute and participate to these um, DAOs, um, what it enables is actually more transparency and visibility on what we are building uh, together as a community. And I think that's the kind of like a bigger uh, like a risk factor uh, shift from uh, traditional finance where you have, let's say you have the cust uh, custodial uh, risk there, you have risk related to not knowing um, what, for example, is happening in the financial ecosystem. And it's not only related to traditional finance, but also in centralized finance, what we saw, for example, with Celsius and Trial Arrow Capital, um, is that you really don't see what is behind of those applications unless it's actually on chain. And also the infrastructure is very uh, resilient. So um, the only lenders, or let's say, uh, let's say all lenders, uh, Celsius and, and, and um, BlockFi uh, repaid was the decentralized protocols because you can't really bend the smart contract infrastructure and, and the rules the same way as you could do on written agreements where you need to go and enforce them in, in actually in, in a court. So I'm very optimistic on what we have been building. And I think there's definitely a new kind of a risks and it's not everything you see in decentralized finance isn't like risk-free as, as, as was mentioned. Um, but it also creates opportunities to figure out how we can make this infrastructure more scalable um, and more secure for, for um, larger audience. Yeah, thanks, Danny. And I'll, I'll follow up with a couple of points. And I like the fact that you touched on some of the centralized entities that fell over in the last few months, you know, whether that be the Terra ecosystem and value being wiped out in a few weeks to Celsius, you, you mentioned, and, and three hours capital. Now, what we have with, you know, the, one of the many value propositions of DeFi, um, you know, and I believe in, 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 in the decentralized ecosystem and, you know, there's many different definitions of, of what is decentralized, but a true decentralized player, we haven't seen any major issues or shocks through this, you know, period of downturn, because you as a user can choose and see and understand what the risks are in this protocol. If I went to Celsius, I had no idea whether they were leveraging my assets or other people's assets. Where were they doing that? And what was the, you know, the knock-on effect or the uh, contagion that, that might happen? So that's really positive. 
And one thing I always ask myself, and this is a Web3 conference, you know, why is DeFi, you know, financial applications, the first use case of this new promise where we can participate and we can, you know, be involved and gain access and contribute to these applications? You know, I have my own view, whether it's, you know, devs coming out of financial institutions, product people coming out, Bitcoin's the first decentralized uh, crypto asset that was used and the first use case was as a, you know, new alternative investment class. So I'll start with you first, Danny, then open it up to the panel. You know, why is DeFi the first use case? And I'll just remember back to Eve Paris last year where Vitalik's speech was a call out to the community to build new applications, not just DeFi. And I think, you know, you've probably listened to that message and been doing that with Lens. So what, why is DeFi the first use case that we've seen, do you think? I think it boils down also to the narrative because, um, you know, blockchain as a use case um, came quite heavily from, from the um, idea of, of uh, creating effectively peer-to-peer uh, -peer cash system with, with Bitcoin. Um, and now kind of like there's a perception more that Bitcoin is more of a store of value. So, so there's already kind of like a narrative of um, um, uh, building better... Um, global uh, finance so i think that affected quite a lot but also if you think about like the underlying architecture of uh, blockchain with the with the uh, security we've been using with the proof of work um you know it it's very um um usable for something like um finance because you want to have a lot of security covering financial transactions and ensure that it's very difficult to um alter this the, the state of the uh, blockchain but over time the technology has has evolved and we've seen now you know applications being coming into play with um, ethereum virtual machine and we've seen um, actually the ability to build more robust financial applications and now that we have this infrastructure uh, a lot of developers in the space are trying to figure out what's the next um, area we should actually uh, work upon and I think a lot of value came through the um, NFT ecosystem as well so NFTs are empowering creators and and they are able to find and go directly to their audiences and, and actually um, create this idea that digital content can actually have value um, the same way as content um, art uh, music has value in um, our real Life. And I think for me, a uh, natural step has been social media because effectively um, the way the current infrastructure is built when in social is that we're creating um, networks for ourselves, but we are actually creating the networks for the bigger companies like Twitter and Facebook. And effectively, we have to um, use the algorithms, the experiences they provide. And as a creator or as a user, you can't actually take your users out of the, or let's say your following graph out of a uh, platform and, and take it to somewhere else. So there is no ownership for that. And I think that's where uh, our focus has been also creating that accessibility and ownership for your own social graph. And I think um, the finance is important because um, I think social, the NFT ecosystem, um, they all have interesting, um, uh, I would say like a um, touching point, which, com which kind of like a combines to everything is the financial layer. So you know, NFTs are not only about self-expression, but it also is self-expression that other people value and that creates market around what you uh, create. The same way as your audience that you create has value um, and you know what your audience might want and like and you can actually share content directly to your audience or create content directly uh, and monetize it. So it, it's, it really like feels to me now, the more and the more I'm thinking about this, um, is that the the financial layer will be always part of um, pretty much everything we're building um, on on chain. Yeah, and before we come on to, to Rupert to talk about some of the risks around smart contracts and how you mitigate them with insurance, does anyone else have a view? Yeah, actually, I was going to uh, add on to that because I thought I think yeah, coming back to your question, like why was DeFi the the thing that people latched onto? It's the natural evolution, right? Because if you if you're able to build a currency that is not owned by any one, in the, uh, any one institution, then you need to build the other components for that. So that was the natural e e evolution. And it's obvious for, for, like, for Vitalik to now start pushing the other agenda, right? So that we do get more broader, um, uh, you know, take up of, of blockchain in, in, in other areas. But 
equally, I don't think we're there. Like we haven't actually built a proper DeFi uh, infrastructure that covers all the areas that we need to move from a traditional financial system into a decentralized one. And then, and like uh, owing to, to your point of like, there is different levels of what DeFi actually is. And that is a whole another conversation in itself. That's a later panel. Yeah, it's a big discussion. Um, yeah, just conscious of time, rolling into the sort of last 10 minutes or so. so. So, Rupert, coming to you, you know, obviously this panel's on risk, touching on sanctions, credit and smart contracts, you know, what's the role of insurance within DeFi and how are you solving that? I mean, honestly, it's it's incredibly important. Obviously, I'm, I'm slightly biased on the subject, but the, you know, if you look at DeFi as a whole, if you look at the whole of, uh, of uh, Web3, in fact, I'm going to turn this into a, a, a bit of a game. Just shout a number of how many, how much uh, you think was stolen last year in hacks and uh, other exploits across the ecosystem. One, H higher or lower than a one? Two, higher and lower than two. Higher, higher. 12, higher. $12 billion was stolen last year. Right, I'm gonna throw, uh, throw it out there. How much money, how much revenue did uh, the Web3 ecosystem, you take out the exchanges, how much revenue did the Web3 ecosystem make it last year? So we got 12 billion of hacks, higher than lower than, than 12 billion. Higher. Higher, higher. That, thank, we got a bit of optimism in the audience. That's good. We made $24 billion. So 50% of it we threw out the door because of these risks and holes that we're not plugging. So yes, there is an absolute massive necessity to plug these holes and risks. And, and I think the problem with risks in our industry is people go, well, the main risk is price, right? It's going to go up, it's going to go down. But actually, no. Like, I've only pointed out smart contracts. We've got, we got stablecoin DPEX, the sanctions. We've seen, um, you know, tornado cash be uh, taken out. And that's had a massive implication across the industry. I know you guys have had to, like, put in a whole bunch of, uh, of efforts to try and plug those holes as well. So, yeah, there are a ton of risks that we've got to cover off. Um, Obviously, if you need smart contract risk and stablecoin DPEG, you know where to go. <laughs> I think just that, I don't know, you know, it comes down to education of just everybody within the ecosystem, actually, those who are trying to enter in. Um, you know, they might, they might feel that they're secure when they uh, gain access to their wallet for the first time and, uh, like, try and do an airdrop or something like that. And then suddenly they've sent five Ether somewhere and it uh, uh, ends up being a scam. But, like, I think with education as well, um, comes the accelerated rise and fall of giants as well as we are in a pre-regulated state. So basically we're gonna see this massive evolution, exponential curve upwards to getting more secure, more aware of these risks and plugging these holes as soon as, quick, uh, as, soon as possible. And maybe to add to this, you know, you know, why is DeFi so big and why is it so successful growth wise? Um, you know, the genius of crypto is obviously the incentive model, right? Why are there thousands of people in the world plugging their computers to mine Bitcoin, right? Because they have an incentive. So DeFi, in essence, at least in the early days, was a way to pay people to test uh, software, which is usually in beta, right? So if you actually decompose these processes, you have some DeFi platform that is offering you some incentives to be an early user so that they can test the risks on you. And you need to be very, as a user, you need to be very rational and very pragmatic about this because, you know, it's not like it's a magical ecosystem that just prints money out of nowhere. You get paid to take on certain risks. And if you don't understand them and if you don't manage them, then eventually you will, you know, you'll get hit, which is very normal. And it all comes down to, again, maturity and tools, uh, either tools that you can use to hedge yourself or working with professionals whose job is to separate these risks and identify them properly. Coming back to insurance, um, now one thing we do at Crypto UK is we run a number of working groups to educate, advocate, you know, create thought leadership and we're, we're launching an insurance working group at the moment because we're finding not just for um, directors getting insurance of crypto exchanges, for example, in, in CFI, you know, we also believe that there some of the risk that we're seeing in hacks and you know we, we obviously are aware of the hack that took place this week week for a liquidity provider with a DeFi product 
Um, is, is, is there a market and is there knowledge at Lloyds of London, for example, and big insurance markets as to what the risks are and are they providing capital to support or is it a decentralised model for insuring DeFi? It's not a straightforward yes or no uh, on that. There is some knowledge at like the, the older school uh, institutions, but I mean, frankly, we've also got to look at the size of us as as an industry, right? We're tiny. We're 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 a, we're a speck on the uh, on the size of the financial services industry, right? And so, for obvious reasons, there is still this uh, opinion that we're just going to go away and get swept under the rug. And so, not everybody in the traditional insurance sector is actually looking at us. But there are some um, some glimmers of hope. We've seen uh, Munich Re uh, come into the space pretty hard and support uh, fledgling uh, DeFi insurance uh, firms with reinsurance capabilities, increasing their, 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 their potential t uh, TVL. There is obviously the issues of that becoming like a centralized, decentralized crossover. But ultimately, at the end of the day, when you, when you, when you look at the risks and you look at the, uh, the amount of TBL or the, the, the way it's reinsured, what users need is to know that their assets are covered and there is a potential payout should the worst happen. Yeah, is there not a model, maybe this is just my blue sky thinking, that in the world of reinsurance, the idea is to distribute your risk, spread it out, take it off your own balance sheet, could like Swiss Re not redistribute some of that risk on chain and let other pools um, buy that risk and get a return? Yeah, absolutely. And I think there's, there's huge opportunities for that all over uh, the, the, the DeFi space. I mean, broadly speaking, there's around 20 or so DeFi uh, cover or assurance protocols that exist. Uh, in, again, in varying arrays of like centralization to, to decentralization. And out of the, the, the kind of the, uh, the, the top 10 uh, protocols that, that make money in our space, I think three of them are those uh, DeFi insurance protocols. So th this is an easy business model for people to get their heads around, especially in the financial world, and therefore an easy way of, uh, of going, okay, so that business makes money, we're, gonna, we're either going to invest into that or we're going to support them in another way by providing these pools and uh, and creating a collective. And, th and there are conversations to that kind of happening in the background. Um, but what comes off in the future, I, I think, is anybody's uh, opportunity. I think we've got a huge opportunity just in general to educate our space that this is available and that it does work. Yeah, okay. I think so, also, I want to say ahead. to that point that I, I think... Um, um, I have a lot of faith in communities actually also like taking um, part of that like risk transfer. Um, for example, we've seen uh, within the Aave community, we have this uh, so-called uh, safety module where you can stake Aave, you earn additional um, yield on that because you're backstopping the, the, the risk of the, the protocol, which might be, for example, some sort of failed liquidation. It might be um, smart contract um, exploit, uh, for example. So you can actively take that risk because you as a community, usually you're setting those risk parameters uh, into the protocol so you can take that additional um, skin in the game. And obviously Aave has um, the kind of like a secondary backstop where additional um, uh, Aave can be minted if, if that doesn't cover it, similar to the maker system. Obviously it doesn't cover like all the potential um, uh, like kind of like black swan events, but it's a nice way to actually get the community involved and, and taking some of the risk uh, out of the table um, for, for this kind of like a, uh, incidents. And especially because most of the risk is actually created through the community. So it's the community that is setting um, risk parameters like um, uh, the launch value ratios, um, uh, liquidation thresholds, and, and also the, the reward, the interest rate. And looking at the moment, like the, the, the current state of the other ecosystem, um, there's also um, contributor, risk contribu contributors such as Gauntlet, um, and they're actively actually um, dynamically changing those risk parameters, and they're paid by the Alva DAO. Um, there's another um, risk operator called Chaos Labs, which is kind of like doing the, creating a bit similar proposal. So there's even like an overlapping risk assessment on the um, risk that is in the Aave protocol and how to reflect 
and, and manage uh, that risk. So I think what I probably what we probably will see is that those operators that that, that care about the protocol risk, they they will also um, get themselves into those communities and actually reflect their uh, opinions and, and, and values and, and also uh, become part of the uh, community. All right, well, I promised questions at the beginning, so we're coming on to the last five minutes. Does anybody in the audience have any questions? Please raise your hand, and I think there's some mics that will find their way to you. Chap in the center here. Um, oh, hi there, Andrew from Galaxy. I was just going to ask, have you got estimates around what percentage of the industry is insured currently and maybe how that's split out institutional versus retail? Uh, it's, it's approximately 1% of all uh, TVL is, uh, is currently insured uh, throughout the, in, in the industry. Now, that's what we can see on-chain. That's not necessarily what we can see off-chain. Um, and from our experience and working with the partners that we, we, we do, the Predominantly, that's uh, institutional uh, capital. Just one over. Hi, guys. Uh, here's Jesus from Genesis. Um, I was curious, like, in light of the exploits keep on happening in all the protocols, do you think we're likely to see decreasing yields in the future uh, if that's an issue that's not to be fixed? Yeah, I can probably address the yields because that's what we spend a lot of our time thinking about. Um, what is interesting in DeFi is very often uh, the yield doesn't necessarily correlate with the default risk, which is very different to traditional finance where the correlation and the dependency is very linear. Um, and I think that's because a lot of people in DeFi don't yet fully care about that risk. You know, you know it is quite bizarre to see that only 1% of you know, DeFi assets are insured, especially given that uh, some of the insurance is pretty cheap. What we're seeing in reality is, you know, these token yields or rather these DeFi platform yields, they, um, they consist of various different sources of yield. And some of that source of yield is a function of how, active people, how actively people trade on the blockchain. Some of that is a function of how valuable these tokens are, um, so on and so forth. So there isn't actually a correlation with the, with the default risk. We do see, however, you know, correlation with overall panic, right? So when we've seen... Uh, let's say, you know, Terra uh, and their UST stablecoin blow up, which, by the way, was not a smart contract risk. It was just pure, uh, kind of poor credit design. We've seen, you know, 70, 80% of TVL leave, um, leave DeFi, even though that specific situation has nothing to do with, with the Aves of this world, with some exchanges that exist in DeFi, but people just left because of whatever technical reasons. Um, so the space is still quite inefficient when it comes to rationally assessing the risk. Um, Akiba from CryptoSlate. Um, users outside of Web3 are used to kind of custodial solutions. How do you think the, the user experience and language needs to improve to be able to get them to also feel safe with the sort of DeFi insurance? I actually didn't hear that question up here. So. Uh, well, we'll repeat that one. Would you mind saying it a, a bit louder? Yeah, no worries. Um, bringing Web2 uh, users into Web3 and for DeFi, they're used to sort of custodial solutions in Web2. So even like DeFi insurance is a, a scary thing for them. Is the language good enough yet? Is the user experience good enough yet? What do we need to do to improve it? Uh, it's, yeah, really good question. It, in short, no, nothing's good enough. Nothing is good enough in our ecosystem just yet. We've got a long, long way uh, uh, to go. But it, there, there is, yeah, glimmers of hope. There, 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 you know, the UX is getting a lot better. Uh, I believe vehemently that as a, you know, a cover protocol, we shouldn't be um, forcing people to come specifically to us. We should be going to where our customers are. So as a user, if I'm in game and I'm buying a, a, an NFT to then that could be lost or stolen or damaged, uh, I should be able to tick a box. And as I'm buying that, it's, it's covered as a, you know, as a DeFi user, I'm going into a protocol and uh, I'm depositing on Aave. I can tick a box and get it covered. That is the experience that we, that we want to get to. But we've got other challenges, namely TVL and capacity of what you can do on current um, DeFi cover and insurance protocols before we get there. 
one thing from the institutional side that we're seeing is that um, it, it takes a lot of effort and energy to establish the right risk frameworks internally, uh, to build uh, the infrastructure correctly so that you're not at risk of being hacked. And this is essentially what we're trying to build out for our clients to provide an intuitive experience that uh, from, their, from their account, they can be able to channel directly into DeFi without having to get into all the nitty gritty, having to set up a wallet, having to set up a custodial solution. So uh, I think from, from that perspective, you will start to see intermediaries and layers uh, be put in place to gently welcome uh, individuals and corporates and institutions in. And then once education is up the curve, people and the technology has improved to become a little bit more intuitive from a peer-to-peer -peer level that uh, it will eventually be democratized back out into the world in a safer way. Okay, I think we're at time, but did the chap here have one more question here and then we'll wrap up. Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, w we've been seeing quite a lot of interest from institutions for sure. Um, that's, that's, I mean, this was for really like a year and a half ago when we launched the, um, the ARC market where uh, effectively we created a um, uh, unique environment for institutions to use smart contract based um, tech, the exactly same AVE market that you, you would use in permissionless DeFi, but with the whitelisting functionality so that the, 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 the suppliers, the, the, the borrowers and liquidators are whitelisted to participate. So it's kind of like a, a step in between for some of these participants to join the markets. Um, and I think one of those uh, kind of like discussions has been also that how you can create stability for uh, interest rates, uh, specifically because many of these institutions, um, if they're supplying liquidity, they want predictability on the yield. If they're borrowing, they also want predictability on the cost of the capital. Um, I've seen a lot of interesting primitives already um, in DeFi where you can actually create things like similar to zero coupon bonds out of the A tokens. So A token is a, when you supply, let's say, USDC into the Aave protocol, you get uh, back AUSDC, um, which is effectively a uh, receipt uh, for your deposit. And you can, um, tokenize it further um, and actually um, uh, sell the future interest rate against uh, liquidity, against a, a fixed uh, price. So I've seen a lot of interesting primitives there, but also like something I've seen uh, on the contrary is that because of the model of how many of these lending pools are built uh, in a way where they kind of like optimize the um, utilization to almost 90, 95%. Um, it's, it's less, it, it's kind of like a competing quite a lot against like fixed um, loans itself. So I, I guess like that's one of the challenges. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But I think, uh, I, I think it's interesting to solve this to some extent because the interest rates are fluctuating quite a lot. So the liquidity wasn't so, uh, it was more expensive, let's say last year compared to today. Mm -hmm. Last year, people were thinking how we get more like, um, um, stablecoin liquidity into decentralized finance. And now um, people in the space are thinking how we get that liquidity out of decentralized finance and we could use it to finance um, real world um, goals. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's definitely a problem to solve. All right, well, um, we're at time. So all that remains is us to thank our panel. Thank you, panel. <laughs>